Well, Bruce, thank you for joining us. Um, and so just because many may not necessarily be familiar with it, what is it, what is it that you do? What's your musical life? And if you could just give a brief introduction of yourself, that'd be great. Well, I'm a composer. I've spent most of my composing years uh, working in film and television um, and related things, theme parks, one video game. Um, in the last few years, not so much commercial music. I've been doing more concert music, more of my own writing, which I enjoy. Uh, there's a difference between the two of them. Um, but the thing about the commercial music that was really interesting for me was that um, it's a great way of gaining a technique as a composer and a very specific technique, uh, which is helping to tell a specific story. Mm -hmm. So we're always working with people who are not musical. Uh, we're there basically to make a story more romantic or less romantic or happier or funnier or sadder or more sinister or scarier or, you know, whatever it is, but it's very, very specific. And it's really interesting because you get to see the effect of music, of different kinds of music on different kinds of people. When you're successful, you're successful with the person that you're working with. Um, and then you hope that that success, and as do they, hope that, that that success transfers out to a larger audience, you know, for their film or for whatever the project is. Um, I was fortunate in that when I began, which is a long time ago, uh, when I got out of school, I worked for 10 years for a CBS television music department, not as a composer, although I did composing there. I started my composing there, but I, I worked uh, on staff as a music supervisor and uh, managed the department for the last four or five years. And in that time, um, because of the work that I did, I learned a lot about uh, music in production, um, I learned about recording, about hiring musicians, about licensing, about, um, you know, the nuts and bolts of music, how it's used. And after that, I went freelance and spent many years doing television shows like um, Quincy, uh, Dallas, um, Gunsmoke. My first credit actually was on Gunsmoke. I'm even in the show. I'm about 25 years old, 26 years old. Um, and then I graduated to uh, motion pictures and, and um, uh, a long way you know, the, of the, the TV shows that I did, uh, some of them were cop and robber shows. Some of them were um, soap operas like Dallas. Some of them were Westerns, How the West Was Won. Um, some of them were just dramatic anthologies like Quincy. So you never really knew from week to week necessarily what you would be doing. Like I, I did one Western, How the West Was Won. Um, with a Chinese theme. It was a story about, it was a two hour TV movie uh, having to do with the Chinese coming over to the United States. So I was in the odd position of having to write music that for a Western audience would sound Asian, but if it were too Asian, obviously, you know, you couldn't do it. So it had to be like very Americanized, very Westernized and still have those, those kinds of elements in it. So, you know, you, you come up with kind of odd things that you learn along the way, which I would not probably have learned had I just gone into um, concert writing. Uh, in the last few years, I've, um, I've been writing things, uh, I mean, for anybody who wants music, I've been writing a lot of band things and concert things, some uh, orchestral things, a lot of things for small ensembles, which I like, so I, I like being very specific. That was one thing I learned from the movies. Mm -hmm. So that's, and I, I, then I do some teaching as well, which I enjoy because I learn more when I teach uh, as you help solve problems with other people um, who are sort of grasping in the dark, you know, not really quite sure where they're going or what they're doing. Um, I, I find it's my job to help define that and get them on their own trail and on their own track, which is really very helpful to me, particularly when I'm you know, trying to solve my own problems. And that's about it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and so, so you talk about. Um, I think the I think the phrase you used near the beginning of, of that was um, music to kind of an, attain an effect. Obviously, with film scores and things with that. Um, how did you have you found your? How have you found yourself translating those skills you learned in film composing and uh, TV scoring to um, concert music? Well, first of all. I would say the biggest benefit to me as a composer working on that kind of stuff was just building up my technique because 
it's just constant writing. When I was doing television, um, particularly in the days before streaming, when it was when there was a real television season, uh, I would say between the months of September and April, it was basically working seven days a week, uh, 14 hours a day, you know, getting this stuff out. So you're writing, 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 and you don't have an awful lot of time to think about it. You don't have a lot of time to plan. Um, you, you know, you, you've got a recording session tomorrow morning. You've got to be ready for that. So you stay up until you get it done. So, you know, you're writing, writing, writing. And so you, you accumulate this technique. Um, the difference, I mean, I, I will eventually get to the question. Um, the difference between that kind of music and concert music is that um, music for television and film and things like that is, race, it is really essentially a compliment. It's not the whole story. The, the basic story is is the film or the story. And we may be filling up um, 5% of the story, maybe 40%, maybe 2%, maybe 80%, depends on, on what service music is, is doing at the time when it's trying to be in a scene. When you're doing a concert piece, you're the whole, you're the whole banana. I mean, you're the whole shtick. There is, there is no picture. There's no girl to look at. There's no guy to look at. There's no car chase, nobody blowing up mountains and things like that. Um, and so the effect, such as it is, if you're trying to make an effect, um, there are ways you can do that. And then it depends on whether you want to go high or whether you want to go low. Uh, what kind of effect do you want to do? Do you, do you want to get a, a, a thing of um, having your piece actually feel as though it's going somewhere and you're carrying the audience along? Do you want to get the audience excited? Uh, do you, is this a heroic piece? Is this a celebratory piece? Is this a, a thoughtful piece where you want to... Um, uh, have people I don't know, meditate or, or whatever, you know, think about it, be more serious. Um, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit the same. Um, I, I guess in concert music, it would be sort of like the difference between, if you get someone like Tchaikovsky, his War of 1812, um, and then one of his ballets and then one of his symphonies. They're all different, but they're uh, at least two of them are, well, one of them is there to make an effect, the 1812 Overture. The ballets are there to help tell a story. And the symphony is there as a piece of music, which which we hope would be entertaining or involving, uh, as well as have some sort of a story, but um, it's not as specific as, um, you know, as the ballets. So it's sort of like that. And could you um, tell us a little bit more about some of the background then specifically? And um, I mean, not moment by moment or anything like that, but could you kind of just give us a brief introduction to Fanfare's Marches, Hymns, and Finale? A background to that piece? Yeah. Um, that was commissioned by a group called the Bay Brass, which is in San Francisco. Um, mostly all brass and a couple of uh, percussion players. It's, it's exactly what the piece is written for. And um, two of the guys who run it um, play, or the, the members of the, of the organization come from the San Francisco Symphony and I think the San Francisco Opera. Uh, they're really, yeah, it's a really good group. They're really high level players. Um, and so they asked me if I would write this piece, a multi-movement piece, which I said I was happy to do. But the two guys, there was a, there was a, not a catch, but there was something else that they, they needed to ask me. Um, they like, actually they found me because they like movie music, you know, mm. and uh, they like some of my scores. And they wanted to know if I would do this concert piece for them. And they said that they really liked, they really liked the movie, the, the music to the movie Tombstone. Um, and I said, oh, I said, so in that case, you like that because it's, kind of big and over the top and very, you know, emotionalized. And they said, yeah, we like that. So that quality um, was something I kept in mind as I was working on this piece. So I would say that the fanfare is piece. Um, it doesn't tell a story, but it does have exciting bits and it does have bits that are sort of dramatic. Um, the slow movement, the hymns uh, have there's sort of like two different kinds of hymns in it. One is almost like a cowboy tune. Uh, and the other one is a little bit more solemn and more, um, um, I don't know, I, I forget the word for it, but it's not quite so free and easy, not so tuneful. You know? And um, 
it had a couple of exciting bits that ends up to a big, exciting finish and all that kind of stuff. So there's, it was meant to be, it was meant to be listened to. It was meant to be enjoyed uh, as it's being played, but it was also meant to be listened to. Um, that's actually a quality that's important to me, which is one of the reasons I went to the movies because um, I wanted to write music that would make people feel something. Uh, because I mean, you know, I love music. I, I listen to it all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm always. My, my wife's a violinist, but she's she doesn't listen to it as much as I do. You know, I mean, I really like to listen to music, all sorts of music. And um, when I write something, uh, although I'm essentially a pianist, I used to play horn, not well, but I played it well enough that I played in the U.S. Army band and I played in junior high school and all that kind of stuff. And so I know what it's like to sit there and play a part. I know what it's like, particularly with the horn. The horn gets some pretty lousy parts in band. You know, it plays in a march, and then it, it plays all the filler stuff. And if the arranger isn't particularly great uh, or too knowledgeable about it, the horn gets the filler stuff. It just plays long notes, and, you know, it's slightly better than playing a trombone part. Um, in a lot of symphonies, the horn is sort of the glue the harmony's playing all the time, the horns are playing. So they, they get kind of crummy parts often, not always, but often. So being a player, um, you become aware of that. And you say, well, what can I do to make this part a little bit more interesting without making it a solo part and taking over the whole band? How can I make this part? So I'm aware as I'm writing things, what it's like to play them. But I'm also aware of the fact that as an audience, I've listened to a lot of really dull music. I still listen to a lot of dull music. You know, you go to a concert, you go, oh man, this one's really boring um i don't want i don't want to have my audiences do that so i'd like to i'd like to have something for the audience have something for the players and um that's that's sort of what i do so working in movies was great for me and doing concert work uh is also really interesting my, the piece i just wrote this week was a short piece for um originally it was supposed to be for euphonium solo well that's hard to do right in just one one instrument so I and it was a specific theme that a, a story or a story or an idea that was attached to it uh, it was meant to be a short piece between two and three minutes long so I decided to add a piano to it to help it along and uh, man it, you know it came out really well but I wrote it sort of in the mood that I would write a um a um, commercial thing because I I knew what the subject matter was about there's no picture, there's no description on stage, there are no actors, there's just the piano and the euphonium playing a short piece, which has got to have, um, for me and, and for the person who commissioned it, um, a real meaningful response, you know. And it turned out really well, you know, really good. So yeah, for things like that, a, a bigger piece like the, the fanfare's piece or a shorter piece, you know, for a special occasion, um, it's good to get input so that you know what you're what you're writing for and who you're writing to and who's going to perform it and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's oh what is it? yeah, certainly, certainly. I mean, a lot of these questions are meant purposely open ended. So, <laughs> well, look, I mean, it, actually, it's it's funny thinking about the piece. The the fan. I mean, I I got to write basically what I wanted. They didn't. I mean, other than the the tombstone thing, which was kind of minor. Um, I, I have a suite, and what am I going to call it? So I decided I start with the family. So then I decide each each movement would be a set piece. Um, so we have it opens up with fanfares, and then it opens up, and I, I put it double because there, there's more than one fair fanfare in this thing. There are a couple of fanfares, and then there's a couple of different kinds of marches, and, it, and at least two hymns, and the finales. Actually, it only ends once, but um, anyway. So. Um, you're trying to figure out what to call the piece. I mean, sometimes, you know, frankly, I would, I would sort of like to be able to write music that just said music number one, music number two, music number three, music number 347, you know, rather than having to figure out what these things were supposed to mean. And I get, I get really amused, particularly in concert stuff, where you go to, a, you go to a concert, particularly a contemporary concert, and they've got these really fancy names and they have these really huge, um, you know, pages of, of notes about what the piece means and all that kind of stuff. And you listen to the piece and you go, I see, it's a drone. Okay, that's good. And that's 
a 20 minute long drone. Okay, I got that, you know, but the, but the notes are really cool. It's got a really cool title. I sometimes think that it's the titles that get the piece played, not the piece itself, you know. So I'm sort of respectful of the title, but uh, sometimes it'd be just nice to call it music. Yeah, not, not overthink it too much. No. Actually, I came across a great title several years ago. My wife and I were in Argentina and we were going to some museum. And uh, I don't speak Spanish, which will be obvious from the story. Um, and so we're going through the museum, the art museum. And they had a lot of pictures called Sin Titulo. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a cool title. Well, what it means is without a title. <laughs> no title. I thought, I'm going to call my piece a Sin Titulo. That's, that sounds really good. Have you written one with that title yet? Not yet. No. Oh. Not yet. no. Well, I mean, I, I feel stupid writing it because... You know, in California, it, it's a Spanish-speaking state, and like everybody, every second person speaks Spanish. Not me. I speak a little German, and that's that doesn't help me at all. You know? <laughs> so um, you talked a little bit, or you briefly mentioned before, um, doing a lot of listening. Do you mind if I ask what you're listening to now? Um, just I'll listen to anything. Um, I, I'm kind of a lazy listener. Mostly I... Um, in the morning, I'll listen to things that I have on my phone. Um, a lot of it is classical stuff. Um, sometimes I listen to some pop. So I don't, I'm not crazy about contemporary pop because it's, there's not much music in it for me. Although I will listen to, um, I will listen to some pop, some contemporary pop, and some older stuff, jazz, um, uh, things from my, youth, <laughs> the 60s. You know, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s when, as I say, when the music was really good, you know, when the songs were really good. Um, I also listen to that. I, I don't listen to film scores too often. Occasionally, I might listen to one, see what somebody's doing. Um, for concert music, I'll listen to, gosh, I'll listen to just about anything. I, I, I really like listening to um, Ligeti and... and um, um, no, what's the Polish guy? Um, Penderecki? Pend no, no, not, not Penderecki, the other one. Um, <laughs> the other one. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, gosh. You know, this is terrible. The name just come and, and drop out of my head. Um, Ludoslavsky. I oh. really like I, I think that guy, um, that guy could really write. A terrific orchestrator, had a great sense of, great sense of form, um, I don't know that he was a melodist himself, but he knew how to use melodies, mm -hmm. and uh, I really inventive. And and he, and in his in the system that he devised, um, he really knows how to make music out of it. Like he has a piano concerto that I I admire a lot. It's like a 19th century piano concerto in his style. And it has all the gestures and all this other kind of stuff. And it, it's a fabulous piece. He has a lot of really fabulous music, but. Um, like I mentioned in Ligeti, I, I was talking to a guy one time who was a, a pianist and he had a movie to write. He was a student at, uh, I think, USC. And he came over and I said I would talk to him about it. And he wanted to do this movie with the instrument he knew best. He wanted to write a piano score. So I said, well, okay, in that case, uh, you want to be able to, to really learn the piano or rather use the piano so that it's um, as creatively um, what... Um, diffuse or, or, you know, varied as possible rather than just play the same thing in the same key all the time. So I said, um, I think I had just bought, I hadn't listened to them yet. I had just bought the, the Ligeti Etudes. So I said, um, for instance, I mean, let's listen to this, you know, put that, well, he knew the pieces. I didn't know the pieces. So we put them on and I thought, wow, wow. First of all, I thought that sounds really hard. They can't be that hard. It just sound hard, but man, that's a really, those are really interesting, you know. So I, you know, continued talking as though I knew what I was saying. And I went back and I listened to them later. I thought, man, these are great pieces. I'm going to buy the scores. I'm going to see what he did on this thing. So I got the scores and I sat down and I, I played through them very slowly. I mean, I can't play those at speed. Um, and I, I, I noticed the most interesting thing. They're all playable. They're all, they all actually sit under the fingers. They're really hard. I mean, they're really, really hard, but they're all pianistic. 
And I'm thinking, oh, man, this guy isn't kidding around. I mean, he really knows what he's doing. So, I mean, my respect for, for Ligeti just went, just, you know, right in the sky. So when I listen to his, to his music, I'm, I'm always kind of fascinated as to what kind of, what kind of thing he's working on now. You know, I mean, like, what's, what's, how is he building this piece and how is he building that piece? Because he's never always quite the same, you know. Mm-hmm. So guys like that, I, I find are, are really, really, really interesting. Um, I mean, it's like that, you know, I, the other day, my wife and I were having dinner and I think I, I had my phone, uh, I was playing music through my phone for the house system. And I just had it on some sort of playlist that the phone had. And so we follow, we follow something like um, Ludoslavsky with um, Wizard of Oz, the overture or something, you know, I mean, it's something silly like that. And, and I'll get, I'll get a whole list of pieces like that that come from every style and, and every time, then go to a cantata of Bach, and then follow it with a Gershwin medley, and then you know things like that. So it's it's kind of fun. It also reminds you that there's lots of different kinds of music, and uh, lots of different things you can do with music, and lots of different people who like to hear this or that. So I don't get too stuck in one style or another. But I do listen to a lot of classical. Yeah. Well, and doing that probably keeps you more mentally engaged too, rather than feeling like, oh yeah, which track is this again? But in the same. <laughs> but, uh, well, I'll tell you, you know, in, in terms of the old movie music, <clears throat> it's like listening to something like Wizard of Oz or, um, I don't know, some old movie score by Miklos Rocher or something like that. <clears throat> Every once in a while you hear stuff that's really well written. I mean, it's really well written. And you go, geez, what is, I mean, I've got to look at this. So then you have to sit down and you listen to it. I mean, there are some things, there are some things in Wizard of Oz that, I mean, not, not all of it, but some stuff that, Somebody really knew what he was doing. I've heard some things from um, some of these really old scores from the 30s where they had a lot of European immigrants come over and, you know, write the scores and all this stuff. Um, these guys were really trained, you know, and um, it's very different from the, the kind of writing you're generally going to hear today. Um, I mean, the styles obviously have changed and there's not so much reliance uh, upon acoustic music because um, students don't have as much access to it um, as when I was when I was younger you know that was all there was when I was in school mm-hmm. and when I first started working at CBS um, doing television shows there was only acoustic music I mean every time we did a TV show we would do it with live musicians well now not so much the budgets aren't there and and um, you find people being very, very creative with their acoustic instruments and being very creative with combining the acoustic sounds with electronic stuff. Um, some people are very creative and do a really good job at it. And some people just write kind of dopey stuff, you know, whatever whatever the key is going to produce. Um, it, I mean, music's always been that way. You always had dopey music along with really great music. Um, well, I mean, look, I mean, I, I said when I was, I was talking to a group at UCLA and... Um, one of the things I said was, you know, most music stinks. <laughs> the, the lady who was leading the class started to laugh. And I said, well, it's true. Most music isn't very good. The stuff that we listen to is basically just a small, small bit of all the music that's been written. If you look at the music that was written in the 19th century or even in the 20th century, tons, tons, tons and tons of music. You know, you look at that IMS, I'm, what is it, IMLSP uh, site, you know, name after name after name after name, and you can click on any of them, and there's like pages of all this stuff, you know, and then you look at it and you go, oh, okay, well, I don't need to look at that anymore. And you go on. So you constantly, you're constantly looking at Brahms and Bach and Bartok and, you know, guys like that, because that's where all the good stuff is. But occasionally there are, there are a lot, of, and I listen to these guys too, occasionally you come across composers who are really skilled composers. They're not they're not the A plus composers. I mean, they, they don't. Um, they're they're not in the league with Beethoven and Mendelssohn and you know people like that. But they're really really skilled composers, and I find a lot of enjoyment in that because occasionally they will do things that that are really inventive, and you want to know you know more about them and and um, hear a few more symphonies and piano concertos and things like that. Like there's a guy I like. Um, oh gosh, I'm pretty. He's, Moskowski, Maurice Moskowski, he was a, um, Moskowski, I guess, he was a French guy with a Polish name. Mm. And he wrote, 
his most famous pieces are probably his Spanish dances, you know, and they're, they're pretty good pieces. He wrote a lot of music that was really well written, not great, but you know, really well written. But occasionally I like to take out something like his piano concerto and listen to it. It's an okay piano concerto. I mean, it's got moments in it. It's not something that you'd want to, you know, go home and have dinner and then go out and hear the Muskovsky piano concerto, you know, but occasionally something like that. Or, you know, a, a better composer, Scriabin, has a great piano concerto. It never gets played. It's like um, it's like a cousin to Rachmaninoff's piano concerto. It's written in that style without, it has melodic stuff in it, but it doesn't have those big, huge melodies and that those long phrases of Rachmaninoff. But man, it's got, it's got a lot of beautiful, beautiful stuff in it. Man, I listen to things like that quite an awful lot. Um, and it's just interesting. And then it's, it's interesting also when you listen to old music, like let's say to Scriabin, you listen to his early music and then you listen to his later music. Well, he didn't live a long time, but there's a big difference between young Scriabin and old Scriabin. And to see how that journey was made in, in the few years that he had, or even Rachmaninoff, who lived a long time, but spent 45 years playing the piano and not writing, the difference in his early music compared to the difference in his late music to me, is really fascinating. Um, and then you see composers, I, I, I guess I won't start naming names here, but because I'm probably going to get somebody's favorite, but um, you get some composers who are just hot out of the box, you know, and they're, in, they're young, uh, not, I'm not even talking about the prodigies like Mozart and Mendelssohn, they're just hot, hot, hot. And then they sort of cool off, you know, they have 20, 30 years of writing music that's very nice. You know, and then at the end, they get they get sparked again. You know, they start writing great music again at the end. It's really, really kind of weird. Yeah, you know, some guy like Verdi, who in 80, writes a completely different style, changes his style and writes all this stuff. And you go, wow, that's, you know, 80? Wow, wow that's, that's pretty cool. So all those guys go into my, my writing pool. So how do you see your, um, how do you see yourself now having composed for, I, I think, 50 something years now at this point? How do you see yourself having grown over that time period as a composer? Well, actually, it's interesting. The last couple of years, I've really enjoyed writing. Um, and the thing I do more than I ever used to do before is I follow the advice of my teacher who said to me, he said, Bruce, the most important part of the pencil is the eraser. <laughs> I didn't really know what that means, but I know what it means now. I was working on a piece today. In fact, another brass piece with the same combination as um, as the one we were talking about earlier, the fan pairs. Um, I'm rewriting, I'm revising it for a performance. Um, and um, I find I erase a lot. You know, I just erase a lot. I change a lot. I sit there, like this morning, I, I spent about three hours working on about three bars. And um, I don't remember what it was originally, but it's not that anymore. <laughs> It, uh, it works really kind of cool, you know, and, and it, I was thinking about the process after I did it. Uh, first of all, I, I get the feeling that it needs to be changed. There's something about it that's just kind of flat or boring or dull or, you know, not interesting, whatever. So I sit there and I start to tear it apart and I start to add things. I do this. And then after a while, I get to a point where I think I've really screwed it up. You know, I really need to go back to the original but I keep working on it and keep working on it and keep working and keep working on it. And before long, it starts to take shape and it starts to become this thing that I wasn't entirely sure it was going to become, but the thing that is certainly an improvement upon what had been there before. So I find that, that um, because I have the time now, I'm not working on any deadline you know, for the most part, I can write and rewrite and change and, you know, take things out. I, mean, I, I was working on one piece a couple of weeks ago, and I, there was a section that just, I mean, I, it was right. I mean, I wrote it right, but it just didn't, I don't know. So I took out like 35 bars, I mean, 35 bars. That took me a long time to write 35 bars. I just took out 45, you know, and stuck these two pieces together. And I went, whoa, that works great. <laughs> I, I, you know, the 35 bars, I mean, they, they were written well. I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't have anything bad, bad to say about it, but it was just, I don't need it. They just slow the piece out. So you just take it out. And then trying to find very often when I get to the end of a piece, I know that I'm in the vicinity of the ending. And I will very often get to the piece and I'll write a double bar and say, okay, that's the ending, sort of. 
And then I'm going to, then you got to figure out how the timing goes to really get there so that it feels like the end. Sometimes you get to the end too soon. Sometimes you get to it too late where the piece has already ended and you don't know it. You know, you're the last guy in the room who knows it. So, I mean, all those, those kinds of things to get the timing right. It's, um, it's really interesting. And then a lot of the stuff that I've actually learned from teaching, um, you find yourself saying things or noticing things in somebody else's music. Like I'll tell you what, what, what I've seen a lot in students. Um, when they're young and they have an education, uh, maybe they're in their last year of school or they're, they're maybe in the graduate, they're working on their master's or something like this. Some of them uh, have, still have a problem writing, coming up with ideas and things like that. And they'll say, gee, you know, what I'd really like to do is this and this and this. And I don't know how to do it. And I'll look at the piece that we're looking at. I said, well, you did it right there. The thing you're talking about, it's right there. It's only for a bar, a bar and a half, something like that. I said, your issue seems to be not that you can't do it. One, that you, can't, you haven't recognized that you've done it. And two, how to do it more. So then we work on it. And you know, after a while, I mean, all these guys improve. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, these people just improve. Um, one woman student I have um, had a complaint like that. And I'd say, well, you, you know, you've done it right there. So she started pulling apart. So several months later, three or four months later, she shows me a piece and I'm looking at it. I just had to laugh because all her complaints of four or five months later had all been solved. Well, not all, all solved, but had a lot of them have been fixed and addressed on this new piece because it was there. She just wasn't quite sure how to get to it, you know? So as a teacher, that's, that's partly what you do. You try to get them to, to their own stuff. So when I start writing my own stuff and I've been doing it, like you say, for 50, actually more than that, 50 years, um, you know, I've, I've got issues in my music too. And rather than beat myself up and say, Oh, I, you know, I stink. I have no talent. Like I said, I look at it and go, I think I can change that. You know, if, if I were my own teacher, I would say, you've got a problem. And you, this, a problem being a challenge, something, a problem, something to be solved, not something that you can't fix or because you're stupid, something that you just need to, to solve. So let's solve this problem. It might take you half an hour. It might take you a couple of days, you know, but you eventually solve it and then you move on. And I mean, that, that part I find really exciting. And I find that when I'm writing, I'm in a really good mood. Mm -hmm. you know? because I'm just curious to see what's going to come up. Hmm. And I say this to young composers all the time, the way you become a good composer is you practice a lot. Like if you want to learn to play the piano or learn to play the violin, you have to practice, practice, practice. And if you're going to be a composer, you have to practice. So write a lot. I mean, he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I would just say one other thing. Write from yourself. Write your own ideas. I mean, write the stuff that comes up from you. And when it shows up, it's the easiest thing to push aside because it just seems to be so common. Well, it is common because it came from you. Meaning, not because you're common, but because whatever you think is what you think and you're used to thinking your own thoughts all day. So an idea comes up and you go, oh. And you go, no, 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 that's an idea. Let me, let me work on this idea and see what it is. And after a while, you, you build this thing. And it doesn't sound like somebody else because it sounds like you. I think that's, I think that's really important. Um, I think it was Nadia Bula and Jay said something about, you know, you can't write better than you are. But a lot of people don't write as good as they are because they're so used to writing, um, of thinking themselves as being inferior and wanting to be like somebody else. So when you do that, when you put, when you put yourself in that kind of a box, you say, gee, I wish I could write as well as whoever it is. You're immediately number two. You know, you just put yourself farther back in the line because you're comparing yourself to somebody else. You learn as much as you can from what other people have done, but it's you, you're trying to, you're, it's you, you're trying to get out. Um, I really firmly believe that composers, artists, writers, painters, dancers, choreographers, anybody who's involved in musicians as well, you know, creative things do it from their physical self that is it's their metabolism that i mean the thing that makes beethoven beethoven isn't his great skill at composing i mean to be honest there are other composers who are more skilled than beethoven um, in terms of moving notes around but 
at being Beethoven, he was really good at that. And this guy had a, an amazing sense of what was supposed to come next, you know, in this form. And he had this kind of pugnacious quality. When he wrote melodies, he felt bad because he, he wasn't as good as uh, Haydn in coming up with tunes. Okay, he was not Haydn, you know? I mean, he, he wrote a lot of music that sounded kind of like Haydn because that was his teacher. But man, there's a big difference between Haydn and Beethoven because these are two very, very different personalities, you know? So I say to people, when you listen to Beethoven, you're listening to Beethoven. I mean, you're actually listening to the guy. That's, that's who he was because the way he phrased, I mean, he did some, he did things that were sort of like minimalism, you know? He's got something in the, uh, I think it's the Sixth Symphony, where it goes, dump, 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 dump. And it goes on for like 34, 35 bars. And there's not one thing that changes in this whole, there's not, <laughs> who knows? It's just this long crescendo and this long diminuendo, and it just goes on. And the question is, how long is that going to last? And the answer is, as long as it needs to, you know. And he was, he was the first guy who did that, because that's a Beethoven thing. You look at a guy like Bach, and you go, oh, lordy, lordy, lordy. I mean, look at this, look at this facility. He must have worked hard for that. And his his response was, I read this somewhere, um, if you'd worked as hard as I had worked, you could do the same thing that I do. You know, one of one of the Bach sons said about, uh, one of the, I, I think it was talking about Carl Philip Emanuel. His, one of his other brothers said, he was a really talented guy. If he had not been so lazy, if he had worked as hard as our father, he probably would have been as good as our father. And you wonder about that because Carl Philip Emanuel was really good, you know. So if he's if that's if that's how good you get being lazy, imagine what it would be like to be a hard worker, particularly with a father like that. You know? So yeah, I think it's really important. The, the, I'm sorry, I, I know I'm going on and on and on, but sometimes people ask me, you know, like what's your favorite piece of music? And I don't know. Who, you know, what's your favorite piece you ever wrote? And I don't know. Who's your favorite composer? That one I can answer because the composers I have um, the three four composers who. I, I hold very high. Uh, one is Bach because of his facility and because of the breadth of his music and emotional. I mean, he, he, I, that guy is, I, I, I don't entirely understand Bach. The other guy, another guy is Wagner. Another guy is Debussy. And another one is Bartok. And those three guys I appreciate not solely because of their music, and I, I'm not saying that they're the greatest composers in the world, but I value their music because they all began as somebody else. Mm. They all began writing okay music. But once Wagner got into his operas, once Wagner became Wagner, it's like, where did that come from? And the same thing with Debussy. You know, Debussy, you know, he was nice. He wrote stuff like 4A and, you know, and then, then he became Debussy and go, Wow, where did you know? And Bartok, the same thing. The early Bartok sounds like a bunch of people, but when Bartok got to be Bartok, you go, wow. And I, I think the answer is they became themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever it was, they they became themselves. So that's what we work on, you know. Then you, you know, that's what you're working on. That's what I work on anyway. So I know you probably get asked this a lot, but if you had a, you know, top one or top two, or maybe even top three film scores that you have written, like which ones are, you know, cause most people love Silverado, Tombstone, Young Sherlock Holmes. Well, I'm yeah. curious which one. I, I, I honestly don't have any. Yeah, I do get answered that a lot. And I, I don't ask that a lot. I don't really have a good answer. Um, there's several, several of them that I enjoy for different reasons. Um, like I always enjoyed the movie Baby's Day Out. I enjoy the score, even though the score sometimes sounds a lot like um, a couple of other composers because they had a big temp track in it that was that sprawled across a lot of classical composers. And I sort of felt like I had to, you know, be in the same vicinity. Um, but I like the orchestration of it. Um, Miracle on 34th Street, I like that. I like the movie. Um, I don't know. Um, the ones you mentioned, I, mean, I like them. I like Silverado and I like uh, Tombstone because they're so different. Mm -hmm. you know, just like I often say in Silverado, it's about good guys and bad guys. In uh, Tombstone, it's only about bad guys because even the good guys are bad guys. You know, They're all doing terrible things. Um, and that movie is so melodramatic and so over the top, uh, which 
Silverado is not. Silverado is very carefully constructed, and you know everything about it is careful. Tombstone is just a rollicking, you know, a rollicking film. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I bunch of them, you know. <laughs> you know, but I can't, yeah. no, I can't say, oh man, this is my favorite one. And you know, if I, I've noticed that composers, if, if you ask a composer, what's your favorite piece that you've written? Oh, my third symphony, you know, and you go, really? Why? Because it's not everybody else's favorite, you know? Well, my favorite piece of yours is such and such. And you go, oh, yeah, that's an okay piece. You know, it's, you know, like who's your favorite kid, you know, of your children? Who's your favorite kid? Well, I don't know. I mean, I like them all, you know? <laughs> well, it, Maybe it's not so easy to pick our own kids, but if you had to pick someone else's kids, so to speak. So if a, a favorite film score that you haven't written. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of those. Okay. Um, Chinatown by Jerry Goldsmith is one of my really favorite scores. I, that was so inventive. Um, I like some of the, the um, everybody else's favorite scores like Jaws, I think is great, you know, because of what it does to the picture. Um, Uh, th those are those are two that really come to mind. I actually it, um, Chinatown even more. I mean, in terms of how it was written and, and the, the style and and the you know the, the concept of it. Um, hmm, I don't know. I mean, I I hear scores occasionally by this person, that person that I like, but I nothing's nothing's jumping up to me right now. That's fine. No worries. Um, and I guess as we kind of close things out here, um, is there any um, particular question or questions you wish people would ask you mm -hmm. these types of things that you would like to say the question and then respond? <laughs> no, not really. Um, what I, I, mean, I, I do a fair amount of, of stuff like this, um, questions and answers. And sometimes the questions are similar. Uh, what I find is that I sometimes answer them differently not because I'm trying to be cute, just because more stuff comes to mind. I, I will say that uh, over the last year or so, as I've done a few of these, the one thing that has come up to me more than anything else has been that um, of, of the things that I've done, of the movies and TV shows and all that kind of stuff, I've had a really good time. I, I didn't have any ambition to be a composer. Uh, my family was musical and I, I studied composition at, at school because it was music. Um, and I wasn't, I didn't know as much about composition as I did about the piano. So I studied composition. It was the only other thing that I was sort of interested in, but I had no ambition to become a composer, not even when I got into college. And I, I thought if I stayed in college long enough, I would know by the end of it what I really wanted to do with my life. Well, I didn't. And um, I, but I ended up with, you know, with this degree and then, decided to get in the movies uh, because I, as I said earlier, I like that contact that I could make with people. It was really a good decision. It was a really good decision because it turned out to be a really good career for me, something that I could give myself heart and soul to, uh, literally. Um, I've had so much enjoyment out of it. I've gotten a lot back. Um, I get letters from people. I don't know how they find me. I guess on my website. Sometimes I get letters from people thanking me for a movie score that I did 30 years ago. And sometimes they're TV scores, the TV movie score, you know, that hasn't been shown on the air for God knows how long. And there's no CD available. I mean, you get all this kind of stuff and you, and you get these responses about how meaningful a certain piece is or the theme. Um, there are, I was fortunate. I didn't plan to do it, but I was fortunate in doing a lot of family movies like uh, Boy Could Fly, Homeward Bound, Rescuers Down Under, all that kind of stuff. Well, these things really resonate with people still in their, particularly in their 30s, you know, the 20s and 30s. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's good. But I mean, I, I've found from these kinds of interviews that um, I don't have any bad stories. I mean, even, even when I thought at the time something horrible was happening, turns out it was really a good story because I really learned something. You know, I, I learned a lot of stuff from directors, um, who just want it the way they want it, you know? And, and sometimes, sometimes you get on great and sometimes it's a slog, you know, but, um, you usually learn something from it. That's really, really worthwhile. I mean, when somebody is very specific about what they want, they don't care whether, <laughs> whether you can harmonize 
you know, America 15 different ways and, and they don't care about your flute voicings and all that stuff. Um, they just care about their movie and make sure that you did it right. Um, I often tell people one of the differences between doing concert music and, and doing movies is that in the movies, you will never hear a director say to you, I, you know, that passage with the flutes, beautiful voicing. I love the way that you took the alto flute down and, and the way that the other two flute and the, and the way it worked, it was exclusive. I, I love, you will never hear that, never. What you will hear from a director is, yeah, that works. Okay, let's go on. Meaning the piece you just finished, yeah, they have, that plays fine, Let, let's move to the next one. Or you'll hear him say, um, can I talk to you about that one? There's a section there that I don't think works so great or, I really don't like this piece. I don't, or this isn't, this isn't going in my movie. You, you got to do something about it. One time I was working on a show on a movie and it was, I was working with a really great guy. I mean, he was a really nice man and um, everything was going well. And he came out at one point and he said, that's not what you said you were going to do. And I said, Oh really? What did I say I was going to do? And so he explained the thing and I thought, Oh, Oh yeah, you're right. I did. And he said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, well, why don't you leave for about 15 minutes, you know, come back in 15 minutes. <laughs> so he, I mean, he literally did. He left for 15 minutes and I looked at my score to see what I had. And uh, I was supposed to, I had promised doing a jazz thing. Or something. So I looked at what I had and I thought, okay, I got a guitar. I got a pianist. I got a trumpet player. I've got a bass player. Okay. Okay. I can do it. So I, you know, I figured it all out and called out notes and changed this and changed that and changed that. And he came back in 15 minutes and I played a new piece. He says, great. Let's go on. I mean, nobody applauds. You know, it's not like, oh, geez, that's the greatest screen. It's just, you know, that's it. Whereas, if, you know, if you do a recital and you go out with your saxophone sonata and your piece for two clarinets and kazoo or whatever it is, you know, and your mom and your dad and your girlfriend and your two cousins and your roommate and, and three or four friends and a couple of people who need the need, need it for um, uh, for their class come in, no matter how bad the piece is, they're going to applaud, you know. And sometimes, you know, it, you can tell by the applause whether they really like it or whether they really get it. Sometimes they don't even get it, particularly if you're doing all this 21st century stuff, this new music stuff, you know, to show that you can do it. You know, they, but they'll be very applaud. Nobody in the movies applauds until they get in the theater. They might applaud actually in the theater. That actually has happened. Mm. But uh, it's a very different kind of experience. It's, you're really working. But I've Again, I, I'm very prolix today. I'm, so, I'm sorry, but I, um, I really, I really enjoy doing what I've been doing, and I'm happy for the music I put out there. And I'm happy that people still respond to it, and I'm happy that on the, you know, the, the you're doing this piece of mine because that's not a movie piece. You know, that's not going to remind anybody of uh, date night. You know, um, or well, maybe it will, but um, but in a different way. Um, well. So I, you know, I'm glad that pieces get played. So, so I was I was talking with some friends last night though, and uh, I mentioned that they were asking me what I was up to today, and I was said I was going to do the interview with you, and they're like, "Oh, the Homeward Bound guy," and one of them started singing the Homeward Bound theme. Yeah. It's like I haven't seen that movie in 20 years, but I can still remember that theme. <laughs> well, you know, it's got. I mean, here's a big difference between Homeward Bound and and um, the Fanfare's piece is that note for note, they're probably written similarly, but, you know, but when that theme comes, the, the theme is used so much in the movie, and it's about you know, the two dogs and the cat. When they come home, there's that doubt in the scene as to whether the old dog made it or not. When the dog finally appears and the, the theme comes in, man, there's not a dry eye on the house, you know. Well, okay, so the, the story itself is, you know, it's very emotional and all that kind of stuff. But with that music, you go, oh, geez, all oh, right. You know, and people say, oh, I just remember. So you play that and, and all that stuff comes back. All the emotions come back from, from the movie and the feelings and all that kind of stuff, which is another really good reason to have done that for a career. You know, it's really kind of cool. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you again so much for making time. And um, I... Uh, Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you in the future and uh, I'll let you know when the, uh, when the performance is uh, up on Facebook. Great. I'm sure I'll be in this very same room when that happens. So, no. <laughs> well, stay safe. Okay. okay. Thanks, Thank Carl. Thank you very much. You too. Okay. Bye-bye.